Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that it is 11.01, and so I am 11.02. I'm going to start. Um, my name is Victor Fernandez. I teach orchestra down in Palm Beach County at the Conservatory School. It's a K through eight school, and I've had the, the the experience of working with kids kindergarten through eighth grade. And so that's to me has really changed their, a, a lot of how I approach teaching. It's the reason why I'm here. I'm really excited to be here. I just want to tell you I've been working on this for months. That's the and, and the packets I'll talk about. And it's funny enough that the last time I looked at the schedule for today, I saw, I had this 11.50 time in my mind. I'm like, I'm good. You know, I'll get out real early, have some breakfast, and head over here. And as I'm driving, I'm getting close to here. Carol calls me on the phone, and it's like, hey, Victor, you're on 11. Ah! <laughs> because, you know, so if you present, please look at the schedule the night before. I highly advise that. See, I, see I'm always learning, so I, I certainly have no ego there. <laughs> but anyways, it's 11 until we're starting on time. And so let's get into it. Uh, I guess I'll give you a, a, a signal. You know, the, the overview for today, okay? Um, because I feel like in order to get the, the most out of this, for me to give you kind of what I have in mind, we have to take this 10,000 foot view approach because I think by changing the philosophy of how you view your time in the classroom, it's going to change what you do in it. So the, I, I also have doing part, like do this with your kids because it's helpful, but also how you view their development. I think it's going to transform how you approach the teaching. So basically, uh, I'll talk about the handout. Um, I want to talk about a few concepts like Austin's Butterfly, the creation of beauty, successive approximations, okay? Then we will talk about singing, the importance of the independence of the left hand fingers. Uh, I've got a couple of videos, okay, there's three of them total, that we will look at to illustrate some of these concepts at work, okay? Um, and then there's a big paradigm shift, which I'm saving, right, for you. Um, then, then it, once we cover that philosophical part of the presentation, we will move into the, the practical component. So I brought my keyboard here, and I'm hoping that if any of you have an instrument, right, and you're willing to, to do some very, very easy sight reading, okay, um, I would love that if you're up for it. It's quarter notes and half notes, we don't want to stress anybody out, okay? And then also play a D major scale so I can illustrate some of these concepts. Um, that would be really awesome. And then I want to leave some time for questions at the very end uh, because obviously the dialogue is helpful. And at the, at the end of your packet on the last page, there is a survey because I've, I've never done this. This is my first time presenting at the FOA workshop. And so I really want to get some feedback on what you thought worked, what you thought was terrible, what I can do better uh, to improve this process. So let me talk about the packet real briefly. This packet is too long, um, it is 18 pages long. Like I told you, I've been working on this for months, and the truth is that when Matt gave me the chance to come up here, I thought, I want to give more than just the presentation, so this packet has at least 10 more, present you know, 10 more presentations worth of material here, uh, which includes things like best practices in teaching. You know those nuggets of gold that you get? Like, and, and a lot of this is like, uh, you know, the best things in, in teaching are stolen. Right, everybody knows that, right? You know, you watch people do things, and that's how we learn as human beings. We watch something that works, we incorporate it. We watch something that works, we incorporate it. And so I've been doing that for a lot of years. And so you have all these like gold nuggets in here, uh, not only with classroom management, but with managing your space. Um, and then of course, there's the, the content from the presentation is here as well. So like it talks about the ear development, so that's on there as well. So there's way, 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 way a lot on here that, that I encourage you to not read right now because I am not going to reference this at all, okay? I'm just gonna be sharing some things with you on the screen. Now, the cool thing about this presentation is that I didn't want to kill any more trees. And so, not to add to the 18 pages already, there's a page on here with links, okay? And the links page at the very bottom has this PowerPoint that you can find on Google Slides. And so if you find any of this useful, relevant, and you want to look at it again, you can be at your office next week and you have this sitting on your desk and if you want to browse through it while eating lunch, that's perfect. If you want to pull it up, it's on Google Docs. And the videos are connected to YouTube off of my YouTube channel. So that's all on there for you, for you. all these links. So we'll talk about the links when I get to that. So with that, without further ado, Mr. Matt, if you can Okay, so basically, um, something beautiful every day, okay? And it's the idea that kids learn to play baseball by playing the game. 
You know, so when a little child comes to the to the field, you know, you're not sitting in a classroom and be like, I'm going to teach you how to play baseball. Lesson one, the bat. You know, and so you kind of learn baseball through successive approximations. They have T-ball. You put the ball, you support the ball with uh, with with a stick. I don't play baseball, can you tell? <laughs> this is like you have a you have a stick that holds the ball, and they, they practice and their technique isn't great, but they play the game. You see what I mean? And so the idea is that with a beginning student, no matter whether they're kindergarten or sixth grade, because you know most schools here in middle start in sixth grade, I've been there. But if you're lucky like us, you know, in elementary, we start in kindergarten. You should always be doing something beautiful. Simple, yes. Blocking a string can be beautiful. Does that make sense? So it's the idea that we want to successively approximate beauty. We start with blocking open a string. Eventually, they add one finger down. And all of that can be beautiful. And there's material for that uh, that, that I can help you connect, connect you with. Um, and so the other part is how difficult can we make this? We don't want to run our classes like, well, we have all of these prerequisites and prerequisites, scales and scales, and you have to do scales. I'm all about scales and technique. But if you only do technical things and you never bring beauty into the music, no matter how simple it is, then you know it, it's they're going to hate you and they're going to hate music. And so I think you have to have a balanced approach. You've got to develop their technique, you, their, their proper playing position. You've got to develop their their oral abilities, while at the same time doing beautiful things every day, no matter how simple they are. Uh, this is a picture of Mr. Perlman, as you can tell. He is in the middle of a rehearsal with his uh, Perlman Music Program students who have a residency in Sarasota every year during the winter time. And the same students are on the other side having chorus class in, during the same residency. Now, I lived in Sarasota for three years, and I was extremely fortunate to have been a part of this. I prepared kids in the Sarasota area to play for him. I also sat through his rehearsals just to watch and listen and, and kind of take in this brilliant musician and what he has to give these world-class players. And, and to me, that one of the biggest takeaways from this is that you have these world-class musicians, and here they are singing. And at that time, I asked myself, how often am I singing in my class? And the answer was zero. So, so that, was a, that was a moment that has stayed with me. And, uh, and the whole idea is that if these master players are doing this sort of activity um, as part of their overall training, it's something that I think we as classroom teachers, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, should be incorporating into our daily instruction, g given the fact that our periods are 50 minutes, right? No matter ha half days or whatever, 50 minutes. I, I'm lucky with my middle school. I have an hour and a half. I know that's not common. Uh, in most middle schools, but you still have to try and fold that in in some way. Um, Tartini's quote, you know, to, to play well, you must sing well, okay? And then the other idea is that correct intonation, okay, happens through the ear, and it doesn't happen through the eye. And I have been guilty forever of putting tapes on my students' instruments, and I am slowly moving away from that, because I'm, I'm moving towards, or I am now in this philosophical realm that, that it's through the ear that we find that pitch, right? I could be blind, I could still play the violin. It's through the ear that I find that pitch. And that's powerful. Okay, so I am a tech enthusiast. Do not call myself a nerd. I am a, <laughs> I am a tech enthusiast. And what the image that you see here on the, on the, on the left side is it's a Minecraft level. How many of you knew that? No one knew that. Come on, not really. Okay. That's a Minecraft level, but you notice how the beginning is very grainy, right? Very grainy at first, and little by little, the image sharpens, right? The image sharpens, and to me, it's this idea that with beginning players, through our artistry, there has to be a process of successive approximations, successive approximations. It's not gonna be perfect the first time. Don't sit there and they want to begin your orchestra and be like, no, your E's out of tune. Play it again, play it again, play it again. Because it's not going to be perfect and you have to accept that. It, it's through successive approximations that we improve. So you point it out the first day, you point it out the second day. You may physically help them find the position. You may physically, you may say, now listen to the pitch on the piano. And they, now you found it. You may do activities like that, but it takes a long time to develop those those. Those, those abilities. And so it's a, the rendering process in computers to me is a really great example of how, you know, the kids are not going to be perfect, but you need to look at them along a continuum of development, of oral development. And, and, and the further along they get on this continuum of oral development, intonation problems will go away. 
And so all of that time that I am uh, uh, guilty of having spent in my in former years, it's out of tune, play it again, high two, higher, higher, low two, how many times will I have to tell you low two, low two, how many times, oh, I'm gonna pull my hair out, give me a marker, oh, you know, white out on your instrument, you're on low two. And the whole time I'm ignoring the fact that I am not developing their darn ear, right? And so, and so now, and so now, I didn't want it to go to the piano, but I have to. And so now, if, if I'm on the piano and they play, like for example, the, the E, E, F sharp, right? I can follow it with some harmony, something like this, like, uh, let's see. The, the, can you sing with it like the, the E, E, F sharp? And let's kind of listen to that in the context of the harmony of the piano, right? You're singing with harmonic context to give you a structure, an oral structure to put that note in. So let's try singing that, ready? Go. <laughs> I take the instrument now, pick up the instrument and play it. And now, I, and then I said, I said, if it doesn't sound right, I said, like, it's as little as second grade, as little as second grade. If it doesn't sound right, and now they echo me back because they know what I want. If it doesn't sound right, it says. That's, the, that's almost like the class model. If it doesn't sound right, it says. No matter how small they are. And so now I say, you have to adjust. And then with my little kids in third grade now, that, that, that I have a more consistent class now, my schedule keeps changing every year. Um, I don't put tapes. I demand that they listen and they find the pitch. This is new for me in a, in a, as, as of the last couple of years. It's not the way that I did things before. And then let's do now F natural. So the, the E, F natural, ready? And. Right, and so if you talk about half steps on the instrument, and I say, listen, it's a half step from the E. It's very, very close, so make sure that you bring it close. And I try to stay away from low two. It's not low two. It's F natural, right? You do have to bring it close. I say they call it low two. Pull it close. And then we play it and do the same thing on the piano. And it's little things like that, little steps like that, with middle school, with elementary school, that they start to get comprehend these pitches floating in the air and the relationship that their hand plays and their finger placement to the pitch. And it's like intonation problems slowly go away. So that's that's a big deal. Uh, before you move on, ah, go back one, please. Yasha Heifetz, big fan. He said there is no top. There are always further heights to reach. So at the top of his, at the peak of his career, you know, a, a master violinist like this saying something like this is to me an infinite <coughs> reminder of the fact that we as musicians are on a continuum of getting better. I'm still getting better at my instrument, right? And our kids are on the same continuum way further back. So we have to move along along that path. Okay, have you seen Austin's Butterfly? How many of you have seen this video? I don't have time to play it for you, <laughs> but I highly encourage that you do because the video is about a little elementary grade boy who can't draw. And clearly, from the very first part, the teacher is teaching growth mindset, right? So the teacher is teaching growth mindset and the idea of successive approximations. And so, he draws the first butterfly, and the teacher gives him feedback. He does it again. He does it again. He does it again. He does it again. And now, through successive approximations, look at the, the progress that he makes on his butterfly. That's why they're playing right there, in a, in a sense. Like the same idea of the growth mindset that you utilize to give the kids feedback and say, um, hey, now you're holding it this way, I want you to change it this way, and I'll try it again. And I never make a big deal of their mistakes. I tell them it's good, make as many mistakes as possible. That's how you get better. So the idea of like divorcing your mistakes from your identity, that our kids a lot of times struggle with, like, I suck. Mm. You know, and, uh, and especially middle school, they start to kind of get an identity that I'm not the good player in the orchestra, you know. Uh, and every orchestra has a huge variety of kids. I have, I have one girl who is an outstanding violinist, and then I have kids in my same orchestra in middle school that you will see um, who are, I mean, the, the most basic position, they are ESC, they struggle, same group. But we have broken that concept out, so he's just, I just get with him. Let's work, let's get better. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a healthier way to run a classroom, I think, versus like, oh, Johnny got an 80 on his test, gotta work harder. Well, he can't, he doesn't know how to. You have to show him how to do it. You gotta show him how to get there. So, so watch, watch the video, it's really, really good. It's on YouTube, it's got tons of views. Okay, so Yo-Yo Ma, It's a Chroma, Yasha Heifetz. 
Um, I think that's Tiger Woods. Uh, that's Joseph Mingold teaching uh, baby Joshua Bell. Uh, and so basically, as a teacher, you are guided by knowing what's coming, right? And so let me just get a, a, a feel for the room. If you play violin, okay, yay. If you play viola, I play viola, okay, good. If you play cello, okay, if you play bass, no bass players. What's going on, bass players, okay? And then if you play another instrument, what instrument do you play? Guitar. Not yeah, okay, so cool. Okay, so the idea is that when you teach your instrument, your, your instrument, artistically, you know what's coming. You know, and so you want to set them up in a way that can lead them to artistry. Uh, same with the guitar. And if you are from out of area, which is why I'm glad you're here, like there's always people, like I reach to my cello friends and my bass friends and be like, hey, what's the, the deal with this pinky? You know what I mean? So always reach out and connect, build a network. So um, the, the big conception here that I want to get to, the big earth-shaking thing that was for me, was the independence of the fingers of the left hand. Um, and then Pablo Casals in his book, um, I forget the title now, but it's, it's in your, that quote is in your packet, that no tension in the left hand means no tension in the right hand. Okay, so we want to set up a, a, a foundation with beginners. We want to set up a foundation that can lead to artistry, to advanced musicianship, and so we don't want to cripple a young player, right, to then have to unteach stuff, to then have to reteach stuff so they can be artistic on the instrument. Right? And realistically, most of the kids we teach will never go to Juilliard. I'm aware of that fact. Most of the students I teach will not go to Eastman, you know, follow violin performance and end up in the Boston Symphony. That's not the case. You know, I work in a Title I public school, but I'm just I'm driven by a commitment to teach the art correctly. You see what I mean? Um, and so, and so I, I, I teach the artistic concepts. You know, we're building audiences, you know, they say we're building audiences of the future. So by me doing this correctly now, I think 30 years from now, there's a benefit in there somewhere, whether they play or not, okay? Okay, so this is Mimi Swig. She is a world-renowned uh, string pedagogue. In this video, in this short 40-second clip, you're going to watch her talk to this uh, very talented young man, and she will say, he was listening for her saying, Make sure you release each finger as you play. He's playing a G major three octave scale, but just listen for that because that's kind of where our conversation is going. Okay? Yep, that right there. Good. That's good. And just just as we go down, be aware that the finger comes before the bow, and we'll relax each finger after it plays. So start at your top. Finger. 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 It's leading their students to the highest levels of artistry. So as someone who is always learning, right, on the same continuum that you are, um, that to me is, is meaningful, okay? Okay, so now, this is really cool. Um, that's Mr. Perlman in my classroom. Uh, I, I know it's really tiny, gosh, I wish this, I, I had this vision that the projector was gonna be massive, you know, like a theater screen, and I would have it a lot bigger. You can see it, but you can see Mr. Perlman, um, so I told you I, I, I work down in Palm Beach, and I have a relationship with the Palm Beach uh, 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 Chamber Society of Palm Beach. And uh, with that relationship, they bring artists. You know how a local organization will bring artists to your classroom to perform. So I, I kind of build those relationships. And we're so fortunate that they are connected, and the board members are connected and friends with Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Perlman. So last March, um, we had a like a day before, like a day prior, hey, Mr. Pullman, Mrs. Pullman is coming to your classroom. Wow, exciting. So we were getting ready for Mrs. Pullman. We were learning the March Slav, a snippet of which you will hear today from my orchestra from my program last uh, spring. 
So Mr. Perlin comes to the class, we play our March Sloth um, um, arrangement, I forget who the arranger is, I should have remembered that. Uh, but he was delighted, he was very happy with it, Mrs. Perlman was there, his arrival was a total surprise to us. Okay. So at the end, uh, his former students were there, they played with us, then everyone relaxed for a minute and I went to talk to him. And, and I think this was, it, it's one of those things that I will never get another chance like this in my life. I'm aware of that. If he was, he was by my door, and you can see this picture here, um, he, I, he, this picture here, I went to Mr. Perlman and I said, um, Mr. Perlman, can I ask you a question, please? When you work with young, with young students, do you encourage the independence of the fingers of the, left, of the left hand? And his answer was a resounding yes. It is the foundation of vibrato. And he went no further. And then we moved on to talk about other things. So got, he said to me, oh, I love how your students have so much vibrato in their sound. And if you know anything about Mr. Perlman, when he works with the students, he demands a lot of expressiveness in their playing. Yes. So he was saying he doesn't do like essential elements, the block fingering. That is correct. Now there are Not exceptions, and, and that's in the packet. There are exceptions like double stops, trills, these, the crossovers of the fingers, like when you play a sharp with third finger and C natural with second. Sometimes there are exceptions to the rule, but I think they're rather exceptions rather than the so rule. So he just would teach G and, so and then F. That, that, right, and so he, he, was, uh, he was most certainly, that's his philosophy, and, and if you watch how he plays, which is the next video we have, Mr. Josh. Now, before you hit play on that, uh, this video, I, I kind of went on a, on a mission because I, I said, I can't stand up in front of anyone and say, we should do things this way because I have no authority, really. I, I teach my classroom. I think I do a decent job of working with my students in my context, but I'm no world violin authority in the, in, the, in the manner that Perlman is. You see what I mean? So for, for a person like me who I've been teaching for 13 years now, to have the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and receive that kind of affirmation on, on a very technical and specific question from a world-class leading authority, then kind of set me on a mission to look at, to pull up videos of every world-class artist I could squeeze into the period of four minutes, okay? And so the, the, the next video that I have for you starts with the Escher Quartet who was in my classroom last May, and then it'll move through a plethora of violinists, violists, uh, cellists, um, bass players, and at the very bottom of the screen you see who's playing or you see their name. So if you're not familiar, you will know who the, uh, who the artist is. And so the key here is watch what's happening here. And again, exception, there are exceptions to the rule, but watch what's happening in their left hand of these world-class uh, individuals who are authorities in their field of practice.
and so, and so, you know, you, you watch these videos, and, and you know, I, I, it, certainly it's not the point to stand here and say this is this is the rule, but these are in a sense of my observations of what's happening at the highest levels of artistry in our field, um, coupled with this absolute lock out of the heavens to have this kind of conversation with with the Um And this shift didn't start for me uh, until maybe three years ago. Uh, in the bio, we will look at it now, please. But in the bio, there is in the bios at the end, there's a gentleman, Herbert Gardner. Uh, who has, over the last couple of years, um, has been a mentor to me in, in, a, in many ways. And one thing he said to me three years ago when he started visiting my class and seeing what I was doing, um, he said, you know, you need to teach your kids to play the way you play, not the way you tell them to play. And I realized back then that the way that I played my instrument, my viola or the violin, was in fact different than what I was teaching, you know. So that's a little tidbit there. Um, so what do we need for a conservatory level student? We want independence and freedom of the left hand fingers, as you can very clearly see from that video. We want tension free bowing, so we want a relaxation in both of the hands, faultless intonation, okay, and a clear tone. And so everything comes to the ear, everything comes to the ear. The ear which guides the pitch is trained along the handling of the instrument. So earlier at the very beginning when I said to you, we want to develop their knowledge of the technical part of the instrument while simultaneously developing their oral abilities, right? And making beautiful things, making, creating beauty, right? Um, that, that is, that is the, the, the balance, right? That is the, the balance. So the student, not the teacher, is responsible for the pitch. Uh, so, you know, it basically goes back to it, it sounds wrong, you need to fix it, versus like higher, 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 lower, lower, it's wrong. And then the kid is like, eh, 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 until they, like, so by, by luck they land on the spot, you're like, great job! And now they have no idea what they're doing. Versus like, okay, sing it, like we did earlier. Okay, now try it again. And then you can hit the glass to help them. Does it sound too high or too low? And then the majority of kids that start developing that, some get it faster than others. You may have one in the class that just nails that pitch every time. It's higher, it's too low. And little by little, they develop that vocabulary, that understanding of kind of pitches in the air. Visually, you see what I mean? Like pitches in the context of other pitches, half steps, whole steps, you know, that kind of oral image of what sound is, okay? Um, and so sing, 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 that's the last part because, you know, um, because that's how we develop their oral abilities. So, so now this is me, this is my video. Now, um, let me give you some context here. Um, this is my, my, my orchestra of 7th and 8th grade students. Um, we are not an art school, okay? We are not an art school. Um, the students do not take private lessons. 95% of them do not. I have maybe two or three in the group, like the girl that I was telling you about earlier. I had a bass player in this group who, be, who became last year's principal bass player at the 7-8 orchestra. So I have some, like, these two students in here, very, very talented, but like I said, you have the whole gamut. It's a very diverse group. Our school, as I, as I said to you, is, a, is Title I. We've lost the Title I this year because we dropped to 69%, but it's still a very diverse group in terms of ethnicity and demographics. It's a very diverse group. Um, and so everything that they do here is not because they went to a private teacher who taught them the part, who teaches them vibrato, who teaches them how to shift, to then come back in the orchestra and play it really well. No. I taught them the things that you are going to see in the context of the classroom. Um, and so I think it's worth noting the context in which that happens. You know, 12 and 13 year old kids, um, um, and then everything, and they don't take lessons. They just add down their own teacher because they could not afford lessons. <coughs> their parents worked two or three jobs. Like a lot of your situations where kids just cannot, parents cannot physically afford, uh, monetarily afford that kind of cost. So let's play that. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Jeff, if we do. Two little clips here. Um, why should I tell you? you? You know the music here. <laughs>
kids who, who never have taken a private lesson, um, and then from a, from a teacher's standpoint of exposing them to masterworks like that, okay, um, it's uh, something to be, to be to, to them, it's a, it's a proud accomplishment, I think. It gives them, as we talked about audience building in the big picture, you know, they're being exposed to great music. Um, and so, but, but to me, that's an example of what's possible um, when you are applying these ideas in, in the teaching um, and approaching the teaching and it, kind of having a different bird's eye view of their development. Um, and so, now we get to the practical part where I hope to take a few seconds to uh, maybe do some, a little bit of playing if that's okay with you guys. Okay, and then time for questions, of course. Um, the video is on my YouTube channel, by the way, and another piece we did that was awesome. So I had to put a snippet of Star Wars because that was just so cool. We had a, we had a, our substitute who was like seven feet tall. I'm like, would you be Darth Vader for us, please? You know, and so, um, and so him and another teacher did that. But they, in that program, we also did This Is Me from The Greatest Showman oh, yeah. with a, 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 a drummer. And the chorus kind of in the audience singing like, whoa, like across each other to the audience back and forth. And that was pretty cool. Uh, that was really awesome for the kids to watch, but I didn't feel it was appropriate to our discussion about developing the ear, just cool. Um, yes? Did those students start in fifth grade with you? Or? Um, no, they came from, uh, some of them Some of them started with me for uh, since they were like babes, since the kindergarten. Okay. Not many of them, because the turnover these days is so high, mm -hmm. that if I were to really give you an honest feedback, like. I could not, it would not be accurate for me to say, yes, I started all of them in kindergarten and then all of them ended in seventh and eighth grade. I'd say like I had middle school, school, right? Although this is middle school, seventh yeah. and eighth grade. I say I would at least have in this orchestra, uh, maybe seven that I had with me for a long time, but a lot of them came from Susan, Mrs. Robert, who teaches down at McKenzie down in Palm Beach with me. And, um, and so a lot of the talented kids that you hear, she started um, at But at a younger age, not like... Younger, oh yes, of course, of course. No, and, and there's, I have things working for me here to make this happen. Like my middle school block is an hour and a half every day. So I get into the classroom, I'm like, we're doing technique. And we're gonna do some scales. And, we, and I have that time. When I was in Sarasota at Booker Middle School, it didn't work that way. I mean, I, for, just to give you a repertoire difference of what I could achieve but I was a, not as good of a teacher back then. At Booker Middle with an hour a day only, grade three, right? Whereas realistically, I can start like venturing into grade four a little bit with this yeah. group. You see what I mean? And so there's that too, you know. Um, but with that being said, even with my elementary classes that I get for 30 minutes, you still want to apply the same balance. So we are all going to be at a different place in what the kids can do based on their, their, uh, their abilities, number one. The time that you have them, that makes a big difference. We, I've been fortunate in that regard. Um, and then if you start them in sixth grade and they've never touched an instrument, that makes a difference, you know? When, yeah. I, when they come to me, they've been at least, they know what to do here. They're not, they're not shifting to seventh position, but the foundation has been yeah. laid by I just Susan. didn't want to get too depressed because my middle school doesn't sound like that. No, mine did not either. No, I, and this is why I, I say this, but this is why I say this to be to be realistic. I get it for an hour and a half a day. Um, and so, but but I think part of why this happens is mostly from the philosophy of, of teaching, that the, 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 what I do when I have them, because otherwise I don't think I could stretch them this far. Um, managing my time, managing the repertoire, and being like, okay, we're gonna be here, and what do I do? The minutia is what makes a difference, you know? Um, which is why I spend so much time on the big picture, because I think, for me, for, to get here, um, this, is, um, this is my 13th year teaching, to get to a point where I can start to be like, okay, um, I can live with this product, I can still see how I can get better, right? But I, I'm, I'm pleased that, we've, that the students have arrived at this point, I wanna push them further. Um, it's taken a long time, um, and so, but the philosophy to me is the biggest thing. It's, it's the what to do. So, um, it's sitting like an orchestra, and there's no, hey, what's Can up? Can I make a super quick announcement? Just no, to remind I'm just kidding, go ahead. Uh, just to remind you that there's a luncheon downstairs in the bistro, so if anybody wants to come, you're more than welcome. Do it's I get for class I'll pay for you, you can come, you'll be my guest. Um, uh, so anyways, it's, it's a Flasta luncheon, but everybody is welcome, and it's $25 for an appetizer, a sandwich, a dessert, and drinks. Yay. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Um, so there are some little notes here that I think are useful, like, like seating, for example, in the orchestra, that should be free and clear of clutter, okay? 
And so when the kids come into the room, everything is already set, right? Or, or option B, which I do sometimes, I teach them how to set it up themselves. And you know, I like children working. That's a good thing. So I teach them how to set up the orchestra so it looks um, so it looks like a clean environment to do to work. And so I think that's an important thing. Um, tuning, very quickly. What I do with tuning starting in second grade is I have, um, I have the kids take responsibility for their tuning. And you can do a million variations of this, but basically you take one violin and you tune it. Uh, and now you have that child stand in front of the class, right? second, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, middle school, it doesn't matter, right? You're a concert master. So they, they play the A and they echo the A. So, A, nya. Okay, and so I teach them if your note doesn't sound the same, it doesn't match, you raise your hand. Because you don't know how to mess with fine tuners because you just started playing, you don't know what you're doing. So raise your hand. And so, in a sense, they take a little bit of ownership over tuning. They're like, mine doesn't sound the same versus just being a dead drone. Nya. And it sounds like D, and they're just blowing, not thinking about anything. So you kind of put that onus on them to be responsible. Um, so I do that. So A, A, D, D, G. And so as they raise their bow, I just kind of walk around the room. You say, play your beep, tune it, you know, up here. Or if the pegs, or if the fine tuners are missing, which I love my instruments, and they are, because we've been like grinding these instruments for years, you know, they're like falling apart, you know. And so, like, I'll pick up the violin and tune it. And so that, that gives you, like, uh, in middle school and elementary, I mean, heck, and high school, if they're beginner players in high school, what's the elementary group here? Okay, let me see, for my elementary people. Hey, okay, now what about middle school? Hey, that's great, and what about high school? Fabulous, okay? And like, I think all of these ideas are transferable up the entire spectrum, because, um, because with high school, if they're already advanced, you just let that happen. You know, have the, the concert master, you follow that kind of more professional routine. They play the A, they tune themselves. But if they're a beginning high school group, I think the same concept would be applicable here. It just, it just really depends on where they are artistically. So, and then you, you, you cycle that, and they just do it infinitely until you get everybody in tune. And I'm really, really, really OCD about intonation because I tell my players, what is the point of starting class if your instruments are out of tune? We are wasting our time. So if they, you see what I mean? And so just to give you a, a little example of that, when I conducted the Broward Elementary Orchestra last year, um, and I'm coming back this year for middle, there, when I walked into the room with 65 kids, play your A. <laughs> right? You have two hours. Play your D. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I tune one instrument and I said, no one play. And so I put the kid to just A, A, and so I literally one by one, I tune all 60 instruments. And I said, what's the point? You know, what is the point of playing at one note if we're not working on this, right? If they're hearing an awful cacophony of noise that doesn't help them figure out what things are. Okay, so uh, tuning then warm up with scale. So now can we do a scale? Uh, some of you with instruments, even if it's one person, that's fine. Um, listen, I am not a pianist. You know, I, I went to Florida State, I studied viola with Pam Ryan. I have a bachelor's in viola performance, a bachelor's in, in music ed, and a master's in music ed. I am not a pianist. I, you, I bet you you play piano better than me. But what I do do, what I, what I do do, what I do, <laughs> hello! <laughs> What I, what I encourage you to do is to harmonize. And I, I'm literally, I'm doing an octave on my left hand and a triad on my right hand. I'm, I'm that kind of piano player. I just printed Fair Elise and I'm like, right, because I'd like to be better. I, I'm on a continuum of piano learning at the beginner level, right? And so I'm not a pianist by any means. So this is why I say this to, if you are not a pianist, hey, I'm the same boat. So let's just do D major scale, and then how about you do two notes each? So E, D, E, 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 and then if you want, repeat, uh, don't repeat the top, E, E, coming back down C sharp. Just one octave, or, or three if you would like. One is good, one is good. Ready? <laughs> so we're going
you know, it, 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 you can, I've gotten fancier, you can tell. I've gotten a little fancier over the time, but I've done it 100 billion times. You know? But when I first started, you see how the idea is that you're providing harmonic context for her to place those pitches in, versus putting, throwing the D and the E and the F sharp kind of into thin air without a reference of like where it is, you know? So to me, that's, that's helped a lot. I do that with my middle school. Um, uh, I do that a lot with elementary. In fact, yesterday I took a, a video clip of my elementary fourth grader singing Twinkle Twinkle with the notes. I have it on my phone. It's like, I, at this point, I had everything printed. I, I don't want to squeeze one more thing, but I had all my fourth grade little great kids. I should do that. They don't sing Twinkle Twinkle, but the note names, like literally, like A, A, B, B, F sharp, F sharp, B, singing in tune. And the biggest problem that my the baby struggle with, and I bet you middle school struggles with, is when they go from E to D. That that D is never high enough, right? And you're always, oh, you're third finger, right? And so you know we scratch it with a knife, you know. <laughs> and so, but, like, but so what I have them do is, and, and like I do this, I do this almost daily with the elementary, not so much middle because I'm in a different place with middle now than I than I used to be. But I have them sing. Okay, everybody sing. Uh, we'll sing together. Go E E D D. Let's sing it. Ready? Go. Right, so I'm providing harmonic context, and I say, okay, now play it. And they, eh, eh, and then you play it, wrong, please. It's wrong, this is not how she plays. Play it too low, and let's see how it sounds. Okay, go ahead. Right, so you hear that, that that's the noise that wakes us up at night, right? Ah! So now, now instead of instead of instead of bark, so I, I say the individuals. You want to hear individuals every day. So I say, okay, now you, now just you play it, and now she plays it. Sounds like that. Okay, I asked it, is that too high or too low? Most of the kids who got the ear working, brother, it's too low. I said, right. So the beginning, most beginning kids make that mistake. Reach a little further with that finger. Reach a little bit further. I will try again. Now you'll be fabulous. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> a really big deal out of that. Ah, that's perfect. Especially if it's a kid who's been struggling, right? Because once that locks, it doesn't go away. That's the beauty of that oral training. You see what I mean? The tape fades away, but this doesn't, right? So that's really cool. Uh, okay, let's go to the next thing. Okay, so how many of you have a, 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 a subscription with with um, Sagi Factory? Oh my God, if you do not, go on there now. I should get paid commission. I, I don't, I'm not a salesperson for them, but this cycling factory, if you are not familiar, it is the most awesome thing in the universe. Basically, you pick the key, you pick the time signature, you pick the difficulty level, and then you hit boom, go. And it gives you an eight measure yeah, of uh, something in D major that starts on D and ends on D, and it harmonically works. It's like AI composition, right? right? And so you can do this. Uh, so this is a level one in D major in four four that we're gonna sing together. Yeah, you excited? Okay. <laughs> and so I, this is the this is the sort of thing I do with my middle school orchestra. Um, we sing very simple solfege and we sing it in American note names like like F sharp, F sharp G, right? Right. So we sing in the notes that they play. Okay. It, like when I was in Cuba, <coughs> I played do re mi, so I sang do re mi, and I kind of take that idea. Without getting into the into the things versus do, please, please don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> we're gonna have a brawl in here, right? Let's leave that outside the door. It's if I play if I play the E F sharp, I'm gonna sing the E F sharp, and that works. Okay, that works. So I have them do this. So let's do it now. Super easy. Um, and so the first time they do it, they're really crappy at it. So I basically play the pitches for them so they can hear. So ready? Wow. Let's try again. That, that 
harmony that there's something about that harmony and hearing that pitch and the harmony that is going to, over time, as you do it again and again and again, and the first time it's going to be horrendous, and you do it again and you do it again, you start developing that oral awareness of pitches and your intonation problems start to become less of a, of a problem in rehearsal. Um, go to the next slide, Josh, please. Um, so, so the other thing to the other thing to think about is how I break up my class time is you know I spend a lot of time on this technical stuff, right? Like there's a link in your packet that goes to a, a book that was written by Mr. Gardner's dad, Samuel Gardner, okay? And this book is written um, orchestra in harmony. So this is your advanced orchestras in middle school, your intermediate to advanced orchestras, right? Who can already read and play notes, and you're going through all of these different keys, and they play in harmony. Right? Very simple things, but, but in harmony. Uh, and I spend a lot of time doing the teaching part. And I spend very little time at the end of my class rehearsing music. So I have my pyramid of in teaching is completely inverted. And with the way it should be, really. Fundamentals, right? <coughs> fundamentals, 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 fundamentals. Scales and arpeggios daily. Singing, and maybe once or twice a week, depending on how we are for time. And maybe the last 45 minutes. But again, I'm, I'm fortunate in my, in my block of time. You know, in another school, you spend 20 minutes doing this sort of thing, maybe 25 minutes rehearsing music, you see what I mean? But this is what makes the music better, and you know that, right? It's not drilling and killing the piece, and I put that in your packet. It's not drilling and killing the piece a thousand times that makes it better. No, it's making them better musicians that makes the piece better. You see what I mean? So I put my eggs in that basket of developing their fundamentals, like their playing abilities, uh, their listening abilities. Uh, and another thing that's not on here is, in that packet on the links page, you, are you guys familiar with Stradiac, you violin players? Right, right, right. Okay, so I collaborated with a a friend of mine, a colleague of mine who, who works in Tampa, and we I, I arranged it for orchestra. Just the first 12 numbers, right? The first 12 runs. So obviously for cello bass, a lot of shifting. But I changed it to some of it being like eighth notes. So while the violins and violas are expected and should go, some of it, like for example, when you go to the part in the exercise that goes, we know that part, okay, right? Everybody nod your heads, okay? Right, the cellos and basses, I changed that so that they, they basically shift to E. C sharp E, oh, I forget the finger, but you see what I mean. C sharp E, B, E, and they're working on finding the pitch, shifting to the E and finding the E. So, so some of the runs for the cello and bass, if it happens for cello bass like the uh, like the E F G A G F E D E F G A, e, and so we're and so we play it slow. I don't go fast. I tell them this is not about speed. It's about doing it correctly with proper technique. Like I'm not a speed person. Like that, that happened because we very, 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 very gradually worked it out because they struggled tremendously to play that when we started. So you know, speed is never a thing. It's like, you know, don't play fast, play it right, right? So the cello, they're like, da, 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 de, da, de, da. I'm more of my cello player, so I'm gonna help my technique is decent for you. <laughs> D, E, F, G, A, G, F, E, D. So they're shifting to third position, and then the violins of yours staying first. So, I arrange that and we work on things like that to get their hand moving, to get their fingers moving, to teach their fingers how to move and to navigate the instrument, okay? This, uh, we don't have time and we don't have an ensemble, but this is one of the pieces from Mr. Gardner that I've used before. This one teaches, uh, this one teaches the crossover. Uh, this thing. Okay, F sharp to C natural. So F sharp with third finger, think about the violin and viola people, right? F sharp, C natural, C natural, F sharp. Does that make sense? And so this piece kind of drills that motion that can be so treacherous, right? When you get into a piece of music that has it and they are bombing it. So there's little pieces like that that he's written which are really useful to teach the, the, the treacherous G, G sharp note that they're, that they're always missing. Or for the cello, the extension for C sharp that is always so problematic in, in middle and high school. Okay, and so that's just one example. I was thinking we would play it, but the screen's too small. Okay, Josh, and I'm, I'm over time, so. Uh, sight reading, and so then for rhythms, I just, I, I don't, you know there's a thousand ways to count rhythm. Like one, you two, you three, ta, 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 ta. There's a million ways to what does it differently. I'm very basic, I just do ta. And what I tell my, my middle school kids is, I leave the slurs out of the time, because the slurs, I think, throw 
the lesser the lesser good ones off. Like if you're not as developed in your in your in your pulse and sense of beat, I feel like putting in the slurs just throws them off. So I'm very square in that sense. So if we toss this with no slurs and just basic toss, let's just do the first two bars because you're gonna be perfect. Ready? And and then I have them also clap. So you want to put build the beat into them because a lot of these children these days, they're like they're like this ether. It's just sometimes they play and there's no pulse, right? No pulse. And like for example, you know, like when you play baseball and you're gonna swing the baseball, you go. Boom! Oh, yeah, I haven't played baseball. You tell, oh, you're gonna golf. You're gonna you do those preparatory motions that you do when you play sports, right? Um, and then somehow when we play music, as musicians that you are, like when she gave me the cue, did you see what she did? What's your name? Abby. Abby. Did you see what Abby did? She did this. D. Right? There was that preparatory motion. I'm sure she took a breath. I couldn't hear. But the point is that we almost have to manually install that in their in their minds and in their bodies to just. Boom, the preparatory motions of, of, of breathing and counting. So for the rhythm, either tapping it or you know, keeping the beat on their body physically while they talk is really, really helpful. And I don't do it enough, I should do it more. Go to the next slide. Okay, questions. And I'm sorry I'm over time, so if you need to leave, please I completely understand. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure sharing this with you. I hope some of it or all of it is useful. And if you have any questions, you can ask me now. I am here, I have more than to go. So thank you.